Hey, I'm Zach. Thanks so much for checking out this week's message. I hope that it encourages you. I hope it challenges you. And I hope that it causes you to dive deeper into God's Word. I also hope that you have some community around you that you can talk through some of these things with. And if you don't, we'd love to invite you to be a part of our community here at Restore, whether that's coming to one of our Sunday gatherings or coming to one of our Restore groups. Either way, we would love to see you. You can get more information about that on our website at RestoreAustin.org. And I hope you enjoyed this week's video. So turn with me in your Bible. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1. You can get it in your Bible, on your phone, anything like that. Just a heads up with the fluorescence on. I can see if you're on Facebook now. So um, you're going to use your phone, you know, just be careful. But as you turn there, I want to set the scene for us, okay? So in Acts, Jesus has just risen from the dead. He's just appeared to his disciples. And it's during these last moments with his disciples that he says these famous words from Acts 1-8 we talked about a couple weeks ago. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. These last words that Jesus speaks would be the last words that he speaks to them before he rises and ascends. And we have this beautiful picture of him. He, he kind of ascends into heaven and all the disciples are there looking up, watching, just like, like, what did he just say? What does that mean? We'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. And they're pondering all these things. And as they do, this angel walks up next to him. And he says, just like he is ascending now, he will descend later to fulfill his great mission of restoration and bring all things to perfection someday. So now the disciples are just waiting not only for that day to come, but also for the day of the promised Holy Spirit, the day when Acts 1-8 would start to be fulfilled. So what do they do as they wait? They pray. Led by Peter, the disciples get together with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and more than 100, it was 120 of them total in this house, in this room. They get together day after day, men and women, all different kinds, people that follow Jesus in this house together, praying, waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. I imagine that they prayed with such fervor and anticipation because they knew something big was about to happen. The Holy Spirit was about to come down and the church was going to begin. These were big days. But remember, Jesus has been promising the Holy Spirit for a while. Back in John 14, 16, he told his disciples, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Did you catch that? Jesus told them he lives with you now. The Spirit of God is among us now, Jesus says, but someday he will live in you. That's massive. That's big. And the disciples knew it. A short time later, that one day would arrive. As they were all gathered together praying in that room, it happens. Acts 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. This is one of the most significant events in the history of the world. Probably third behind Jesus coming to earth the first time and then him dying and being buried and rising again. This is probably the, the third most significant moment in all of human history. And let me tell you why. It's because when God, in this moment, he goes from living among us to living in us. That's huge. That's massive. He's not just living among us. He's not just around us anymore. Now through the Holy Spirit, he indwells us. 
The long-awaited and often predicted day is finally here. You may remember John the Baptist, he talked about this day at the very beginning of Jesus' story back in Luke 3.16. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And that prophecy from John has just been fulfilled. These men and women have been baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And with that, the church is born. The church is born. God descends on a group of people about the size of of our group here. Imagine all of us just packed together in this gym, packed together in some house somewhere. We're praying, we're waiting for this day to come and it's finally here. The Holy Spirit descends. What's the first thing the Holy Spirit uses this new church to do? Back to verse four. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now some of that, some of us, that verse makes us a little uncomfortable, right? Begin to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. That may be kind of confusing or maybe you've never experienced something like that before. I'm gonna explain exactly what's happening here. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans, and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. People from all over the known world hearing about God in their own language, in their own tongue. Even though these people didn't speak the same language, the Holy Spirit supernaturally enables the first church to speak so that every single person can understand exactly what they're saying. The first thing, don't miss this, the first thing the Holy Spirit does with this new church is to declare the wonders of God to all people. That's the first thing he did, declare the wonders of God to all people. Race wasn't a barrier anymore. Gender wasn't a barrier anymore. Ethnicity wasn't a barrier. Education level wasn't a barrier. Even language isn't a barrier anymore. The Holy Spirit removed every single barrier so that every single person can hear about the wonders of God. That's the purpose of the church, my friends removing our barriers so that everybody can know the grace and the hope and the love that's only found in Jesus. He's been doing it since day one. It's such a beautifully explicit picture of the mission of God that we talked about in week one of this series. God using his people to accomplish his plan of bringing salvation to his world. Salvation is for all because Jesus came for all. This has been the mission of God from the very beginning, but he takes it to this whole new level with the first church. But I I want you to put yourself in the position, in the shoes of the people listening to this. You are from some other country, okay? You find yourself in Jerusalem. You're hanging out on the streets. Maybe you're eating some local food. Maybe you're having some kosher coffee, you know, at a little coffee shop on the streets of Jerusalem. You're hanging out. And all of a sudden, you hear this huge commotion. And, and you don't know what's, what's happening, right? You hear this huge commotion. And so you get up from your seat and you take off toward where all this noise is coming from. And as you approach it, you get closer and closer and closer. And you don't know what's happening. You don't know what's going on. But as you get closer, instead of hearing confusion and commotion, you actually begin to hear the wonders of God in your language, crystal clear. You know that you're the only one in this area from your part of the world. You know that these people, they're from Galilee. They're not from where you are. And yet, as you walk up, you hear the wonders of God in your own language. They reacted probably like you or I would have reacted. Verse 12, amazed and perplexed, they said to one another, what does this mean? I love this part. Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. (laughs) They do what a lot of us do when we experience something supernatural. 
right? They kind of shrug it off. They're like, oh, that, that's, that's weird, right? Maybe they're drunk. I don't know. <laughs> that's confusing. I don't know what's happening. They, they shrug it off. Now, take yourself out of them, their shoes and put yourselves in the shoes of that first church. You've been in that room for days and days waiting and praying for the Holy Spirit to come and now he finally has. And you kind of you put yourselves out there, right? You walk out of this room and, and you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you start speaking and you don't even necessarily know what you're speaking but people start coming and you really put yourself out there only to kind of be mocked by the people that come. Only to be called drunk by the people that come. They're probably a little embarrassed probably even a little bit hurt. And in this moment, at this point, the first church could have just turned around, gone back into their prayer room, and never come out again. They're like, like fine, if, if you're gonna act like this, I'm trying to tell you about Jesus. If you're gonna act like this, I'm just gonna go back. I'm not gonna talk to you about it anymore. I don't wanna risk the embarrassment or the hurt anymore. But man, thank God they didn't. That's not what they do at all. Listen to what they do in verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and to all of you in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. <laughs> oh, that's one of my favorite verses in all of scripture. <laughs> They're not drunk. It's 9 a.m. I, I, I adore Peter's response here. And let me tell you why. Because it teaches us a vitally important lesson that I think so many churches and Christians have missed. You see, people have been making fun of the church since literally moments after it came into being, right? Like the church happened, people are making fun of it. It's happening today. People make fun of the church all the time. I tell people I'm a pastor, they give me weird looks. It's been happening since the beginning of time. Verse 13, some made fun of them. They've had too much wine. They're just drunk. But how does Peter respond. He doesn't get mad. He doesn't claim persecution. Oh, I, I'm being attacked because of my faith. He doesn't go to Facebook and talk about how everyone's out to get him because he's a Christian. He makes a joke. Hey, they can't be drunk. It's 9 a.m. He laughs it off. Peter could have been a jerk. He could have picked up his ball. He could have gone home. He could have said, fine, if you're going to act like that, I'm not going to tell you about Jesus. I'm just going to go sit back in my prayer room. <laughs> but he doesn't. He makes a joke. And after that, Peter has their attention. He's earned the right to be heard by them at this point. You see, being a Christian doesn't give us the right to be heard by people. Just thinking that we know exactly what the truth is doesn't give us the right to be heard by people. We have to earn the right to be heard by people. And earning the right to tell someone about Jesus can be done in a variety of ways. But listen, it always starts with not being a jerk. Every time. It starts with that. It's that simple. You be kind to people. That's what it starts with. Now that Peter has their attention, here's what he says. Now remember, this is the, this is the very first church sermon ever in history. It's recorded right here. It's the very first gospel presentation ever, and it is so awesome. He starts by going right back into this prophecy about that day, about the day of Pentecost, the day of the Holy Spirit would come down from the book of Joel in the Old Testament. Verse 16. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see vision. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Did you catch that? The Holy Spirit is given to everyone, regardless of age, young men, old men, regardless of gender, even men and women. This would, have been, this would have been shocking. This would have been taboo in this society, right? Because in this society, you basically had to be a man of a certain age to have any rights, to own anything. But Peter's saying, no, that's not how this society functions. It doesn't matter who you are or where you're from. It doesn't matter your age, your race, your gender. The Holy Spirit is for all. The Holy Spirit levels the playing field because the Holy Spirit isn't only given to certain ages or races or genders or lifestyles. The Holy Spirit doesn't care who you are or what you've done or where you're from. The Holy Spirit cares about one thing. That one thing is found in verse 21. 
but everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who places their faith in Jesus is saved. Everyone who calls on the name of Jesus receives the Holy Spirit. It's that simple, but it's profound and it's countercultural, especially in the first century here. Now put yourself back in the crowd. Remember, you've heard this commotion, you've rushed over. When you got over there, you heard this crystal clear communication in your own language of the wonders of God. Now this, this really funny guy named Peter has gotten up and made some jokes and then started talking about who Jesus is. He starts talking about a, a new civilization where anyone and everyone can be saved, where anyone and everyone can experience freedom, no matter who you are or what you've done. Now, if I'm in the crowd listening to this, I'm in, right? That sounds amazing. That sounds amazing. I just saw an incredible miracle and then heard about a society where there's equality, diversity, grace, hope, love, and salvation for all people. A place where everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I'm in. It's a no-brainer. All I would need to know is who is this Lord and how do I call on him? If everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, then who is this Lord and how do I call on him? I don't know if they said those questions out loud or Peter just knew what they were gonna ask, but he goes right into it in verse 22. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And with you, and you, excuse me, with the help of lawless men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Quick pause here. I love Peter's word play in this text. Do you know who these lawless men are? They're the teachers of the law. These lawless men are actually the keepers of the law. They're the ones that were given the task of making sure that they fulfilled the Old Testament law and that everyone around them fulfilled the Old Testament law. They were the religious leaders. They were the Pharisees. They were the teachers. They were the priests. And yet, their hearts were so hardened by pride and by their own morality. They were so puffed up that they didn't realize that the law that they were tasked to fulfill was actually being fulfilled in their midst in the person of Jesus. And they got so threatened by him, so upset by who he was and all the things that he was saying, so scared that he was taking their power away that they murdered him. And these keepers of the law end up becoming the most lawless men of all because of their self-righteousness. And it's at this point in the story, after Jesus dies, that it's kind of a, kind of a downer. Nobody knows what's going to happen next. But then we have the very best two-word phrase in all the Bible. I've said this a bunch of times. The very best two-word phrase in all the Bible, but God. Something terrible happens, but God. Verse 24, they had just killed Jesus, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. The earthly courts said Jesus was guilty and they put him to death, but the heavenly courts overruled. The highest court of all declares that Jesus is innocent and they make him alive again. God raises him from the dead. Exalts him to the highest place. So who does this make Jesus? Verse 36, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and and Christ. There's the answer to our first question. Who is this Lord? Peter says, you can be sure of this. Jesus is Lord. Peter answers the first question and then they come right at him with the second question. Verse 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Okay, okay, we believe we're on board with Jesus being Lord, but how do we call on his name? 
Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Who is Lord? It's Jesus. How do you call on his name? You repent. We're going to finish up our time together this morning by really looking at this word, repent. How many of you have heard this word before? Stick your hand up. So most of us. I want uh, you to picture in your mind what you think about when you hear the word repent. You need to say it out loud or anything. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands again. But when, when you hear the word repent, what comes into your mind? What picture? So I'd love to go around and ask each of you to answer that question, but we don't have time for that. So I decided to ask Google what comes into its mind when it thinks about the word repent. So I type the word into Google, and here's what Google Images gives me. Here's the first one. Void hell. Repent. Trust Jesus today. Here's the second one. Repent or else. Look at the artwork on the flames on the bottom there. Impressive. All right, here's the third one. That's a little cut off, but it says, Repentance is you turning from sinful ways to God's way. So any of those images or any of those texts, is, is that similar to what comes into your mind when you think about the word repent? Give me a little nod, a little, yeah. Is it similar? I tell you, it's, it's almost exactly what comes into my mind when I think of the word repent, some version of that. And I think that it started when I was a kid. I remember the first time I ever heard the word, I was in a Sunday school class. I was probably eight years old. And we were talking about how you come to salvation, how you, how you get saved, right? How you ask Jesus into your heart, all of those kinds of things. And I remember my Sunday school teacher drawing this huge U on the board. And she said, you have to repent. You have to turn. You have to make a U-turn. You're going the wrong way, away from Jesus. You need to repent, make a U-turn, and go back the right way toward Jesus. Leave all your sin behind and pursue Jesus. That's how you receive salvation. And I remember thinking, like, you know, what, what are these sins? And she answered, you know, things like lying to your parents, things like taking toys from your siblings, you know, things like acting up in school, things like talking back to your teachers, all these kinds of things that I participated in regularly. <laughs> and I, I remember thinking, as she described what really repenting mean and, and the sins that we needed to turn away from, I remember thinking, even as an eight-year-old, I can't do that. I can't do that. That seems impossible. And so to me, there were two choices left. It's pursue the impossible or just kind of let this whole Christian faith thing go. Because if I'm not ever going to be able to do it, why would I pursue it? And that was one of the moments in a series of moments that led me to believe that I would never be good enough for God that I could never truly leave all my sin behind enough to where he would accept me and he would love me. And I carried that with me for a long time. And I tell you what, even in my darker moments, I carry it with me today. It's been ingrained in me somewhere as a child as I see that big you on that stupid chalkboard. And I think about, I need to, I need to U-turn. I need to get away from my sin. Only then can I really pursue Jesus. Somewhere along the line, so many churches and Christians have decided that repentance means turning away from sin. But there's a huge problem with that. It's not what the Bible says. It's not even what the biblical word repent means. Even if you've missed everything else I've said today, don't miss this. Repentance is not about turning away from your sin. Repentance is not about turning away from your sin. The word repent in the Bible literally translates to change one's mind. To change one's mind. That's what repent means. This is what it means and this is how it's used throughout the Bible. When John the Baptist is preaching at the beginning of the New Testament, he says, Matthew 3, 1, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's not saying stop sinning. Because the kingdom is here. That wouldn't make any sense. Hey, don't sin anymore because the kingdom is here. At this point, people believe that God's kingdom was way in the future. 
John's saying, repent, change your mind. The kingdom is here now. You thought that the kingdom was coming way in the future, but change your mind. My friends, the kingdom is here now. Jesus says something similar to John after, he's, after John's arrested in Mark 1. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. He urges the people listening to change their minds. Change your mind and believe in the gospel. He isn't saying stop sinning and start believing in the gospel. Those things aren't mutually exclusive, right? A lot of us sitting in this room believe in the gospel and we still sin. We still struggle. He's saying change your mind. You see, the people he's talking to here believe that the only way for salvation was keeping all the laws, trusting in their own religion. He's saying, change your mind, trust in me. Change your mind, trust in the gospel, the good news about who I am. Change your mind, repent. Here in our text from Acts 2, Peter just finished reminding the people in the crowd what they thought about Jesus. They thought he was a liar, they thought he was dangerous, and so they killed him. They trusted in their religion, in their religious leaders, instead of trusting in Jesus. Peter is saying, no, don't don't trust in religion. That's so empty. Trust in Jesus. He is Lord. He is Savior. Repent. Change your mind about who Jesus is. You thought that he was lying. You thought he wasn't God. You thought he wasn't Lord. You thought he wasn't Savior. But I am telling you, he is risen and he is. Change your mind. Peter does this throughout the book of Acts. He uses this word repent, but he's not the only one. In Acts 17, Paul says the same. Paul, we see him visiting this part of Athens, Greece, right? And he's in this area where there are all these statues and idols representing all these different gods and goddesses. And one of the altars even says, to an unknown God. And so Paul gets up before all of the people worshiping in this area and he tells them that they don't have to put their faith in unknown or made up idols or statues anymore. And he tells them about Jesus. Then he calls them to repent. Verse 29, Acts 17. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone. It's not a a made up thing, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. You used to think that these handmade statues and idols, these gold and silver things were God, but they're not. I'm telling you who is, it's Jesus. Change your mind. Stop trusting in these things and start trusting in Jesus. Repent. Change your mind. Don't make turning from sin a requirement for salvation. Peter never did, Paul never did, the first church never did, and most importantly, Jesus never did. Turning from sin comes after salvation. We've flipped the order. And I'm telling you that the results of flipping the order of that have been catastrophic for the church. Because we have told an entire generation of people, probably generations upon generations of people that they are not good enough for God's love. That they are not ever, ever going to be good enough for God's love until they get rid of all the stuff in their lives and whoever decides what all that sin is and what it means, that they can just get rid of all of it and conform to some moral standard that we put on them, then finally they'll be good enough for God's love. killing us. It's killing our churches. We don't clean up and then come to Jesus. We come to Jesus and he cleans us up. You don't, you turn from all your sin and fix yourself up and leave all of it behind so that finally you can be good enough to be wrapped in the arms of Christ. He wraps you in his arms in the deepest, darkest moments of our lives. We just sang about it. He's not afraid to enter into those places and give you mercy and grace. That is the whole story. That's the whole story of the gospel. That's it. That's what separates Christianity from every other religion, everybody else. Even our society is telling you, you need to be something in order to receive something. 
You need to be good enough to receive love. You need to be good looking enough to receive praise. You need to be whatever to receive whatever. Jesus is saying, I love you just the way you are. And I love you enough to not leave you that way. I want to enter in to the brokenness, to the hard parts of your life, and I want to change you. But man, we flip the order. Because we've made repent. Somehow we've taken that word and we've made it something that it never was meant to be. We've literally changed the definition of a biblical word. That's bad, guys. That's really bad. It's in there. It means to change your mind. And we've said, no, it means turning from sin. So you better be good enough for Jesus. That's bad news. It's bad news that you have to fix yourself to be good enough for Jesus. But I tell you what's good news. Romans 10, 9. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It doesn't say, if you declare with your mouth, believe in your heart and stop sinning, you will be saved. Man, and praise God it doesn't say that because me and every single person in this room could not partake in salvation if it did. You don't have to change your life. Jesus does that for you. You don't have to change your life. You just have to change your mind. You don't have to change your life. You just have to change your mind. There's a hard truth in here that I want to make sure that you're hearing before we go. What you believe about Jesus is of ultimate importance. What you believe about Jesus is of ultimate importance. You don't have to stop sinning to partake in salvation, but you do have to make up your mind about Christ. And these are big claims that he's making. He's fully God and fully man. He came to earth, lived a perfect life that you and I could never live. He died the death that we deserved. As Peter said, death couldn't hold him down though. And he, he's the only person in the history of the world to overcome death and rise from the grave. And now he offers salvation to anyone if they will simply believe in him and trust him. Jesus is Lord and Christ. So here's my question to each of you this morning. Have you made up your mind about Jesus? Have you made up your mind about Jesus? Because if you haven't, just like Peter and Paul and John and Jesus did, I am urging you to repent. Now, I'm not urging you to repent like the crazy people on the street corners with the megaphones and the hell flame signs, okay? I'm urging you to change your mind about who Jesus is because I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, I have changed my mind about who Jesus is and it is the single greatest thing that has ever happened to me. It has changed everything for me. And I want to see that for you. I deeply care about you and I want to see that happen in your life. If you haven't changed your mind about Jesus, make today the day. It's time. Place your faith in him. Let's all stand up together. I'm going to pray a short kind of Romans 10, 9 kind of a prayer for us this morning. And if this is a morning where you want to change your mind about Jesus, I'm going to invite you to just pray it in your heart, in your mind, right after me. Let's pray. God, thank you that you have made Jesus both Lord and Christ. Thank you that he is God, that he is our savior. Jesus, I change my mind about you. Jesus, I believe you are who you say you are. Jesus, I want to stop trusting in temporal things. And I want to start trusting in you. Jesus, I repent. Jesus, I declare with my mouth that you are Lord. Jesus, I believe in your heart that you were raised from the dead. Save me. Send your Holy Spirit to live inside of me. I want to experience 
you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.